This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Anarchy Works by Peter Gelderloos Part 1. Introduction Anarchy would never work. Anarchism is the boldest of revolutionary social movements to emerge from the struggle against capitalism. It aims for a world free from all forms of domination and exploitation. But at its heart is a simple and convincing proposition. People know how to live their own lives and organize themselves better than any expert could. Others cynically claim that people do not know what is in their best interests, that they need a government to protect them, that the ascension of some political party could somehow secure the interests of all members of society. Anarchists counter that decision-making should not be centralized in the hands of any government, but instead power should be decentralized. That is to say, each person should be the center of society, and all should be free to build the networks and associations they need to meet their needs in common with others. The education we receive in state-run schools teaches us to doubt our ability to organize ourselves. This leads many to conclude anarchy is impractical and utopian. It would never work. On the contrary, anarchist practice already has a long record and has often worked quite well. The official history books tell a selective story, glossing over the fact that all the components of an anarchist society have existed at various times and innumerable stateless societies have thrived for millennia. How would an anarchist society compare to statist and capitalist societies? It is apparent that hierarchical societies work well according to certain criteria, they tend to be extremely effective at conquering their neighbors and securing vast fortunes for their rulers. On the other hand, as climate change, food and water shortages, market instability, and other global crises intensify, hierarchical models are not proving to be particularly sustainable. The histories in this book show that an anarchist society can do much better at enabling all its members to meet their needs and desires. The many stories, past and present, that demonstrate how anarchy works have been suppressed and distorted because of the revolutionary conclusions we might draw from them. We can live in a society with no bosses, masters, politicians, or bureaucrats. A society with no judges, no police, and no criminals, no rich or poor. A society free of sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. A society in which the wounds of, from centuries of enslavement, colonialism, and genocide are finally allowed to heal. The only things stopping us are the prisons, programming, and paychecks of the powerful, as well as our own lack of faith in ourselves. Of course, anarchists do not have to be practical to a fault. If we ever win the freedom to run our own lives, we'll probably come up with entirely new approaches to organization that improve on these tried-and-true forms. So let these stories be a starting point. And a challenge. What exactly is anarchism? Volumes have been written in answer to this question, and millions of people have dedicated their lives to creating, expanding, defining and fighting for anarchy. There are countless paths to anarchism and countless beginnings. Workers in 19th century Europe fighting against capitalism and believing in themselves instead of the ideologies of authoritarian political parties. Indigenous peoples fighting colonization and reclaiming their traditional horizontal cultures. High school students waking up to the depth of their alienation and unhappiness. Mystics, from China a thousand years ago, or from Europe five hundred years ago. Taoists, or Anabaptists, fighting against the government and organized religion. Women, rebelling against the authoritarianism and sexism of the left. There is no central committee giving out membership cards, and no standard doctrine. Anarchy means different things to different people. However, here are some of the basic principles most anarchists agree on. 
autonomy, and horizontality. All people deserve the freedom to define and organize themselves on their own terms. Decision-making structures should be horizontal rather than vertical, so no one dominates anyone else. They should foster the power to act freely rather than power over others. Anarchism opposes all coercive hierarchies, including capitalism, the state, white supremacy, and patriarchy. Mutual aid. People should help one another voluntarily. Bonds of solidarity and generosity form a stronger social glue than the fear inspired by laws, borders, prisons, and armies. Mutual aid is neither a form of charity nor of zero-sum exchange. Both giver and receiver are equal and interchangeable. Since neither holds power over the other, they increase their collective power by creating opportunities to work together. Voluntary Association People should be free to cooperate with whomever they want, however they see fit. Likewise, they should be free to refuse any relationship or arrangement they do not judge to be in their interest. Everyone should be able to move freely, both physically and socially. Anarchists oppose borders, of all kinds, and involuntary categorization by citizenship, gender, or race. Direct Action It is more empowering and effective to accomplish goals directly than to rely on authorities or representatives. Free people do not request the changes they want to see in the world, they make those changes. Revolution Today's entrenched systems of repression cannot be reformed away. Those who hold power in a hierarchical system are the ones who institute reforms, and they generally do so in ways that preserve or even amplify their power. Systems like capitalism and white supremacy are forms of warfare waged by elites. Anarchist revolution means fighting to overthrow these elites in order to create a free society. Self-liberation Quote, The liberation of the workers is the duty of the workers themselves, end quote, as the old slogan goes. This applies to other groups as well. People must be at the forefront of their own liberation. Freedom cannot be given, it must be taken. A note on inspiration. Pluralism and freedom are not compatible with orthodox ideologies. The historical examples of anarchy do not have to be explicitly anarchist. Most of the societies and organizations that have successfully lived free of government have not called themselves anarchist. That term originated in Europe in the 19th century, and anarchism as a self-conscious social movement is not nearly as universal as the desire for freedom. It is presumptuous to assign the label anarchist to people who have not chosen it. Instead, we can use a range of other terms to describe examples of anarchy in practice. Anarchy is a social situation, free of government and coercive hierarchies, held together by self-organized horizontal relationships. Anarchists are people who identify themselves with the social movement or philosophy of anarchism. Anti-authoritarians are people who expressly want to live in a society without coercive hierarchies, but do not, to the best of our knowledge, identify as anarchists, either because the term was not available to them, or because they do not see the specifically anarchist movement as relevant to their world. After all, the anarchist movement as such emerged from Europe and it inherited a worldview in accordance with this background. Meanwhile, there are many other struggles against authority that spring from different worldviews and have no need to call themselves anarchist. A society that exists without a state, but does not identify itself as anarchism, is stateless. If that society is not stateless by chance, but consciously works to prevent the emergence of hierarchies and identifies with its egalitarian characteristics, one might describe it as anarchistic. The examples in this book have been selected from a wide range of times and places, about 90 altogether. 30 are explicitly anarchists. The rest 
are all stateless, autonomous, or consciously anti-authoritarian. More than half of the examples are from present-day Western society. A third are drawn from stateless societies that provide a view of the breadth of human possibility outside of Western civilization, and the remaining few are classical historical examples. Some of these, such as the Spanish Civil War, are cited multiple times because they are well documented and offer a wealth of information. The number of examples included makes it impossible to explore each one in the detail it deserves. Ideally, the reader will be inspired to pursue these questions herself, distilling further practical lessons from the attempts of those who came before. It will become apparent throughout this book that anarchy exists in conflict with the state and capitalism. Many of the examples given here were ultimately crushed by police or conquering armies, and it is in large part due to this systematic repression of alternatives that there have not been more examples of anarchy working. This bloody history implies that, to be thoroughgoing and successful, an anarchist revolution would have to be global. Capitalism is a global system, constantly expanding and colonizing every autonomous society it encounters. In the long run, no one community or country can remain anarchist while the rest of the world is capitalist. An anti-capitalist revolution must destroy capitalism totally, or else be destroyed. This does not mean that anarchism must be a single global system. Many different forms of anarchist society could coexist, and these in turn could coexist with societies that were not anarchist, so long as the latter were not confrontationally authoritarian or oppressive. The following pages will show the great diversity of forms anarchy and autonomy can take. The examples in this book show anarchy working for a period of time, or succeeding in a specific way. Until capitalism is abolished, all such examples will necessarily be partial. These examples are instructive in their weaknesses as well as their strengths. In addition to providing a picture of people creating communities and meeting their needs without bosses, they raise the question of what went wrong and how we could do better next time. To this end, here are some recurring themes that may be beneficial to reflect on in the course of reading this book. Isolation. Many anarchist projects work quite well, but only make an impact in the lives of a tiny number of people. What engenders this isolation? what tends to contribute to it, and what can offset it. Alliances. In a number of examples, anarchists and other anti-authoritarians were betrayed by supposed allies who sabotaged the possibility of liberation in order to gain power for themselves. Why did anarchists choose these alliances, and what can we learn about the kind of alliances to make today? Repression. Autonomous communities and revolutionary activities have been stopped cold by police repression or military invasion time after time. People are intimidated, arrested, tortured, and killed, and the survivors must go into hiding or drop out of the struggle. Communities that had once provided support withdraw in order to protect themselves. What actions, strategies, and forms of organization best equip people to survive repression? And how can those on the outside provide effective solidarity? Collaboration. Some social movements or radical projects choose to participate in or accommodate themselves to aspects of the present system in order to overcome isolation, be accessible to a greater range of people, or avoid repression. What are the advantages and pitfalls of this approach? Are there ways to overcome isolation or avoid repression without it? Temporary gain. Many of the examples in this book no longer exist. Of course, anarchists are not trying to create permanent institutions that take on lives of their own. Specific organizations should come to an end when they are no longer helpful. Realizing that, how can we make the most of bubbles of autonomy while they last? And how can they continue to inform us after they have ceased to be? How can a series of temporary spaces and events be linked to create a continuity of struggle and community? 
the tricky topic of representation. In as many cases as was possible, we sought direct feedback from people with personal experience in the struggles and communities described in this book. With some examples, this was impossible, due to unnavigable chasms of distance or time. In these cases, we had to rely exclusively on written representations, generally recorded by outside observers. But representation is not at all a neutral process, and outside observers project their own values and experiences onto what they're observing. Of course, representation is an inevitable activity in human discourse, and moreover, outside observers can contribute new and useful perspectives. However, our world is not that simple. As European civilizations spread and dominated the rest of the planet, the observers it sent out were generally the surveyors, missionaries, writers, and scientists of the ruling order. On a world scale, this civilization is the only one with the right to interpret itself and all other cultures. Western systems of thought were forcibly spread around the world. Colonized societies were cut up and exploited as slave labor, economic resources, and ideological capital. Non-Western peoples were represented back to the West in ways that would confirm the Western worldview and sense of superiority and justify the ongoing imperial project as necessary for the good of the peoples being forcibly civilized. As anarchists trying to abolish the power structure responsible for colonialism and many other wrongs, we want to approach these other cultures in good faith in order to learn from them. But if we're not careful, we could easily fall into the accustomed, Eurocentric pattern of manipulating and exploiting these other cultures for our own ideological capital. In cases where we could find no one from the community in question to review and criticize our own interpretations, we have tried to situate the storyteller in the telling, to subvert his or her objectivity and invisibility, to deliberately challenge the validity of our own information, and to propose representations that are flexible and humble. We don't know exactly how to accomplish this balancing act, but our own hope is to learn while trying. Some indigenous people, whom we consider comrades in the struggle against authority, feel that white people have no right to represent indigenous cultures, and this position is especially justified given that for 500 years Euro-American representations of indigenous peoples have been self-serving, exploitative, and connected to ongoing processes of genocide and colonization. On the other hand, part of our goal in publishing this book has been to challenge the historical Eurocentrism of the anarchist movement and encourage ourselves to be open to other cultures. We could not do this by only presenting stories of statelessness from our own culture. The author and most of the people working on this book in an editorial capacity are white, and it is no surprise that what we write reflects our background. In fact, the central question this book seeks to address, whether anarchy could work, seems itself to be Eurocentric. Only a people who have obliterated the memory of their own stateless past could ask themselves whether they need the state. We recognize that not everyone shares this historical blind spot, and that what we publish here may not be useful for peoples from other backgrounds. But we hope that by telling stories of the cultures and struggles of other societies, we can help correct the Eurocentrism endemic to some of our communities and become better allies and better listeners whenever people from other cultures choose to tell us their own stories. Someone who read this over pointed out to us that reciprocity is a fundamental value of indigenous worldviews. The question he posed to us was, if anarchists who are mostly Euro-American are going to take lessons from indigenous or other communities, cultures, and nations, what will we offer in return? I hope that, wherever possible, we offer solidarity, widening the struggle, and supporting other peoples who struggle against authority and without calling themselves anarchists. After all, if we are inspired by certain other societies, shouldn't we do more to recognize and aid their ongoing struggles? Linda Tuiwai Smith's book, Decolonizing Methodologies, Research and Indigenous Peoples, London Z Books 1999, offers an important perspective on some of these themes. Recommended Reading 
Erico Malatesta, at the Café, Conversations on Anarchism, London Freedom Press, 2005. The Dark Star Collective, Quiet Rumors, an Anarcho-Feminist Reader. Oakland, AK Press, 2002. Krimith, Inc., Days of War, Nights of Love, Krimith, Inc., 2002. Daniel Guerin, Anarchism, From Theory to Practice, New York Monthly Review, 1996. Bell Hooks, Ain't I a Woman? Black Women and Feminism, Boston, South End Press, 1981. Mitchell Verter and Chaz Buffet. Dreams of Freedom, a Ricardo Flores Magon reader. Oakland, AK Press, 2005. Derek Jensen, A Culture of Make-Believe. White River Junction, Vermont, Chelsea Green, 2004. Vine Deloria Jr. Custer Died for Your Sins, an Indian Manifesto. New York, Macmillan, 1969. Ward Churchill, From a Native Son, Selected Essays on Indigenism, 1985-1995, Cambridge South End Press, 1999, or his interview on Indigenism and Anarchism in the journal Upping the Ante. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.